day of April, sorry, fourth day of May 2019. And it is a beautiful rainy Saturday morning. We are happy to be here. We're grateful for how far we've come in the year. As usual, we're coming to you live from the studios of TV3 here in Accra. We're also live on 3FM 92.7 and streaming live around the world at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page at TV3 Ghana. As usual, we encourage you to send through your messages and your remarks in respect of the topics we'll be discussing to our WhatsApp number 020-2166633. And we will share them as we go along with the program. Now, today on the show, we shall be looking at matters at the heart of two days we commemorated this week. We'll start off with International Workers' Day or Labor Day or May Day, which was celebrated on 1st of May 2019. That's just this Wednesday gone by. We shall also look at matters concerning press freedom as we commemorated World Press Freedom Day yesterday, Friday, the 3rd of May 2019. So International Workers' Day came and went by this week on Wednesday. Workers across the country gathered to commemorate the day. The usual protests that characterized the day featured. The president also, as is expected, delivered a speech. Among other things, the president directed the Minister for Employment and Labor Relations to liaise with SNIT. National Pensions Regulatory Authority, NPRA, to bring finality to all outstanding pension issues in the next three months. Of course, the day would not pass without the voice of the opposition being heard. Former President John Dramani Mahama and now the flag bearer of the opposition NDC in a Facebook post bemoaned what he describes as the harsh and hard socioeconomic environmental matters that um, environment that the, the, the Ghanaian worker is operating within. So really and truly, nothing new happened. We had the parades, the president spoke, we heard from the opposition, and TUC and other labor unions also spoke. Today on the show, we shall be looking at the significance of May Day, exactly what are the conditions of service for Ghanaian workers, and particularly, we shall be focusing on pensions, as that was the theme for this year's celebrations. Then we turn our attention to World Press Freedom Day. Yesterday, Friday, 3rd May 2019, was commemorated all over the world as World Press Freedom Day. Now, in recent times, some of us may take freedom for appreciation of the commission of such a day but definitely not for persons who not only witnessed certain periods of our national history which have come to be known as the silence or the periods of silence but also fought for what we are enjoying today now on the show this morning we shall be looking at press freedom as it pertains to Ghana and exactly how well the practice in the country. So these are the two important topics we've outlined for today's conversations on the show. We'll take a break. When we come back, we will start off the conversation with our first set of panelists looking at May Day celebrations and matters arising. See you in a bit. Welcome back. This is The Key Points. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7, and online at 3news.com, also at TV3 Ghana on our Facebook page. Uh, we'll be delving straight into the conversations with a look at May Day celebrations and matters arising. Um, the panelists are in the studio. I'll quickly introduce them. From my extreme left, we have Mr. Solomon Kote. He is the General Secretary of the Industrial and Commercial <coughs> Workers Union. Next is Mr. Hayford Atakrufi. He is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Pensions Regulatory Authority. And to my right, we have Mr. Seth Abloso, who is a labor consultant. Good morning, gentlemen. Welcome to the show. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Now, before we start the conversations in studio, let's take a quick listen to the speeches given by the Secretary General of the TUC in the person of Dr. Anthony Yalba. We'll also take a listen to the President's speech 
as he addressed the workers at the May Day celebration grounds at the Independence Square. So let's take a listen to these two and we will return to the panelists. Ghana's total working age population is estimated at 30 million. Just about 1.5 million of them have access to pension under SNIT. This means that over 11 million people do not have access to social security. This is not acceptable in a rich and proud middle-income country like Ghana. Something has definitely gone wrong in our economic and social policy. I believe it is time we face reality and start asking ourselves some of the difficult questions. Development remains our collective responsibility and aspiration. Should we continue to pay greater attention on improving the conditions of the few who are in jobs? Or should we concentrate on creating the atmosphere for more jobs to be generated? For years, we all said many public officials were pushed into corrupt practices because they were so badly paid. Salaries and conditions of service have been improved for many, and we have not seen the equivalent improvement in the quality of the work they do. Great. So those were um, speeches, snippets of the speeches um, given by Dr. Anthony Alba, who's the Secretary General of TUC and the President at the May Day Parade on 1st of May 2019, addressing um, workers who had gathered there, and indeed the general um, populace. Um, I'll be starting the conversation off with you, Mr. Kote, here. And um, quickly from, from where um, the President and um, the TUC Secretary General, you know, started us off as it were. A number of issues raised in there. Obviously, May Day will never go by without issues about conditions of service of workers being raised. So, yes, <coughs> it came up. And uh, it was lamented excessively that workers are, you know, working in harsh or difficult conditions. Um, the president is also talking about productivity issues. There's always been that, you know, attempt to ensure that both sides are satisfied, good salaries, you know, with, with, with good, good performance at, at, the work, at the workplace and all of that. This is, isn't new, really and truly. So what is it about this year's May Day that, you know, we should perhaps look at and say, well, hmm, perhaps something different isn't often? Well, thank you, and my due regards to your viewers. If we pick that of the Secretary General, you will notice that he gave a simple data that suggests that in Ghana, we have over 13 million working force, but only 1.5 are assessing social security. That gap is so worrying, is so disturbing, because we all don't work for today, we work for the future. And that if people are working and no provision is being made, no secured provision is being made for the future, that is something that labor cannot be just happy about. It also suggests that there is a window of opportunity for viability for SNITs. Because if SNIT work hard, it will be able to rope the gap of 11.5 that are not contributing to SNIT to get into their fold. And the bigger the purse, the bigger pensions that could actually be paid. So the focus that Labour brought to this 2019 May Day was to bring awareness to workers that we are working for the future. And if the future will grant us additional lives to go, how we live depends on what we have, provisions we have made for it. Right. And therefore, we decided to bring the wake up call, not only to em employees, but to the employers and government as well. We did this with the notion that workers, to a large extent, don't even look for their pay slips to see whether what their basic salary is, it is exactly or what the employer is paying in social security yes. contributions. Much more do they even find time quarterly to even go and demand their statement to see whether the, the contributions that, that, that are made yeah. are being paid. Because we also uh, gathered our data out of research and saw that when people are about to retire, 
and then they go for that. That is statement. when they begin to. Then they yeah. see a lot of gaps. Now they want to change which accountant was that right place at the time, and they cannot be found. And then they are short chain. Not that they are short chain. It is what you have given to Snit, it is what Snit to depend on, and then give it to you. Then beyond. So there's an element of responsibility on the part of the employee or the worker exactly. to chase up on those things. Exactly. You don't expect them to be done. Um, by the employer, yes. you don't take that for granted. You don't take that for granted because we have experience where employers have got different basic pay they pay to workers, and then they pay different statutory deductions using different basic salaries altogether. So that shortfall is there huge. And finally, for us in Ghana, since we also introduced the Act Seven Sisters, mm. okay, which will be coming to full force next year, 2020, we've also, out of our research, realized that. The data over there is also not complete, and workers will be expecting to go back and make their, you know, payments out of that place. So this year, maybe, is so unique and it's so important. It goes to the soul of every worker, and we believe the employers themselves will also be aware to look at it. In fact, among other things that the Secretary General said was the fact that the uh, formula that SNIT uses to pay, you know, workers' pension. Labor have realized that there's a problem with it, which is being brought before the MPRA for us to mm. see what solutions we can find. Beyond this, again, you could notice If I may just probe further, what is the problem with the formula? The formula We'll definitely be looking at the pensions in great, great detail, though, but just, you know. Well, why is Labor feels that uh, instead of using monthly, okay, uh, salaries, aggregate of three to look for the best salaries, we are looking at annual. Okay, so monthly and annual, definitely the difference is huge. Sure. Okay, so the with labor is also saying that the actual scientists that came with the formula, nobody understands it. I don't know that even the boss of MPRA understands the parameters that suggest that you must use uh, three to divide, what shows that you shouldn't use two to divide or even one to divide and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, labor is saying that, Snit, you have done well. At your portal now, you just place the formula there. But yeah. every formula ought to be defined. These formulas are not defined and just take and then go and apply it. Yeah. It does not really actually help. So we are pushing this battle with uh, Snit itself and then the MPRA to help us get these things defined. Because when you Get but are you retirement. suggesting that the formula was 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 um, defined or selected or chosen without consultations from you know stakeholders? Uh, the labor is asking which law is supporting that formula. Mm. Okay, it's, it's it's such a formula that is applicable to every working you know Ghanaian. So if we are coming up with a law, that law must be tested. In fact, with our simple mathematics, if you could any formula you must define all the parameters but here we are we find a formula the, the parameters we can't define them we don't know what they represent they will help us if we understand it to know whether or not uh, if i want to get a, a good pension then what do i do in the parameter where do i fit in to be able to make sure my contribution becomes very relevant yeah. so these are things that labor is very mindful about that if you only look at us for today we'll be short changing Definitely. ourselves and the future will look very bizarre for us definitely right mr um, Atakufi, so i'll come to you um, 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 Mr. Kota here, you know, ended on a certain note, and I would want you to pick up from there. The formula, raising issues about the formula. They want to know exactly what went into that formula. First of all, tell us what that formula is, what were the considerations made, and indeed, if you're taking on board what they are saying, which is that, well, let us know exactly what goes into it. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Let me also say, Good morning to your, to your viewers. Um, I think maybe before I come to yeah. the formula, let me also pick up from the statistics of the uh, 11 million people right. who are not uh, contributing to uh, Social Security. Basically, we have a, a, the formal and the informal sectors of our economy. Uh, Ghana has got 85% of, uh, of our working forces in the informal sector. Some states actually 90. Yeah, well, it's mm -hmm. uh, within the, the range. Informalization is yeah. really increasing, Huge. you know, yeah. by the by the day. Um, yes, only 1.5 percent uh, contribute to a SNIT, which is uh, in the formal sector, basically. So the 11 percent are workers in the informal sector, and out of that, about five million of them are in agri and fisheries, for example. So. Even though the law makes provision for both formal and informal sector to have access to pensions, uh, because 
the, the informal sector, they don't have a regular uh, income. Mm. Uh, it is very difficult to apply a particular formula as it applies mm. in the formal sector to them. So we are entreating most of our corporate trustees to, be, to begin to penetrate into the informal sector through their unions, through their cooperatives, through their associations, and to see if, how we can reach people who are in the formal So more like they are in the formal sector, but they are not being accessed uh, towards the, uh, the, the, the Senate mm -hmm. pensions. And so the challenge there has to do with the fact that you cannot um, count on regular inflows at the end of the month, for That's instance, to say that, well, this is the fixed percentage we're going to be taking exactly. out. So until that is done, are we saying that they cannot well, they benefit do. from... They do, but it's voluntary. See, we have a we mm -hmm. have three-tier right. pension system. So tier one has got a, a, a particular formula, so a percentage of your sure. salary is taken. Tier two also has a particular percentage of your salary taken, but tier three is voluntary. So the informal sector worker will have to determine how much I'll be able to give as part of my pension contribution mm. per day, per week, per month, per year. Mm. So that flexibility is there. And indeed, because there is no uh, compulsion in it, people tend to think that maybe it's not necessary for me, unless, of course, there's education and sensitization exactly, before needed. people right. would know that they cannot to pay. Coming back to the issue that Solomon, you raised, uh, these are matters which are before MPRA, uh, so maybe we may not be able to exhaust everything here, but the issue to do with uh, formula is, is, is defined in the law, you know, uh, Act 76, mm -hmm. Section 77, 1 and 2 actually defines the formula. A SNIT pension is what we call defined benefit pensions, which means that this, it is predetermined by formula. I mean, tier two will be a defined contribution, which is just what you contribute plus your investment returns, which gives you a lump sum. But a SNIT pension is based on the formula, and then the formula is your the best of your three uh, three best years of your entire working life. So we take an average of it, and then we, it's fifty percent. By more of years that you've worked beyond your 15 years, because mm -hmm. the, the minimum that you need to work to qualify for pension is 15 years, which mm -hmm. is 180 months. But for every year that you work beyond that, you get 1.5 percent, which is used <coughs> as part of the formula. So that formula, Solomon, is defined no, by law. No, what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. law. Yes, we say law. Why three months and not two months? your mm -hmm. salaries in the best years and I will take three of them mm -hmm. and then three. But, but, but Mr. Well, Kote, Mr. Kote, Kote yeah, the, is, let me, let me ask a question. I, I asked a question earlier which had to do with the fact that whether or not other stakeholders were consulted when this law was being, you know, put together. Because currently yeah. that is the law. And so to be questioning it now would suggest yeah. that, well, maybe there were no consultation and it was, you know, at, imposed on us as it were. I just want to know whether indeed that is what happened or in hindsight where you're thinking that well maybe it's time we reviewed this yeah. yes. which I'll, one is it i'll come by that it's about time maybe we get it okay so, so yeah so then we have that because otherwise the history to it and we don't want to go back into too much into history but this whole process started in 2004 mm -hmm. when there was agitation uh, from the Labour Front, sure. I mean, in comparison between what you were getting under SNIT and what, what uh, Cap 30 was also providing. And that is when the, the government then set up the, uh, the Bidiakon Commission. And there was one between 2004 and 2006 mm -hmm. when the report was produced and a white paper came out and as a result of that came the, the, the Pensions Act. So right. the consultation was, uh, and, and that formula that was, uh, was devised was meant to give you a better, a better pension than maybe before. Uh, but, but I do hear him as well, which is that, well, this is, has been in place since 2008. Yeah. And it's so it's 11 years. Yeah. So he, well, trade unions been. or labor union is saying that, well, maybe we should yeah. look at it again. Do there you think that, that, that they've made a good case for a review of this? I mean, a law is a living document. Mm -hmm. of exactly. Course. Yeah, it's dynamic. So that conversation needs to be had. For example, between 2008 and 2015, there was a review mm. because 
uh, Labour believed at that point that uh, 766 said those who were 55 uh, 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 and below would come under 766. But somebody's 55, he's got only five years to retire. So if you bring a new law, it will be difficult for the person to realize the full effect and the yeah. full impact of it within five years. So that same conversation took place, and then there was a review where the new uh, an amendment Act 883 was passed, and then the years peeled back to 50 years. So that at least for 10 years, people will be able to realize the full impact of uh -huh. their contribution. That is why you mentioned the fact that it will come into full force in 2020. But the law is in force. It's, it's, it's in force. Uh, people who are retiring, those who are 50 years and below, who are retiring and retiring <coughs> and are being paid under seven cents. So it's been, it's, it's, it's working. Very well. Mr. Setabloso, yes. your perspectives on this May Day celebrations 2019, what exactly, what is, what, what is the, 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 the main highlight you'd want us to look at? Uh, thank you. May Day is of immense significance to workers and employers and governments. That's why at the parade scene in Ghana, the, the president sure. always being welcomed as a, a special guest of honor and number one worker mm. in this country. Uh, this year, the focus has, has been on sustainable pensions. Uh, which means that it should be pension that we should move forward to, that will give uh, appreciable income security in employment. And that is what social security is all about. Uh, the situation we have and economic fundamentals make it say that this aspiration hasn't been met. Uh, prospective pensioners are afraid of going on pension. And that is why we have the incidence of persons reducing their age. Uh, to stay in the workforce a lot for a longer period. Yeah, for, for a longer period. Uh, so, so those are some of the issues. But uh, fundamentally, pensions can be improved if we have uh, prudent management of, of funds and prudent investments. In fact, when we started in 1965, the quantum that was being contributed, the total from employers and workers, was 22.5%. 22.5%. After the overthrow of the CPP, then 5% was cut off. Uh, then we came to 175 uh, With the agitations for meaningful pension, the formation of the uh, Presidential Commission on Pensions, uh, during the Kofor era, introduction of the pension scheme presented hope that things would be better. Mm. Yes, the uh, and then we had a situation where SNIT was restricted to only managing the first year. The second year was made provision was made for private operators uh, to operate. Now it became necessary to amend acts. At 766, along the line, because government as an employer was owing heavily in its contribution, and said that persons who were due for uh, retirement didn't have their contributions available to the uh, private fund managers to manage. And the law had to be amended to avoid that. Is, uh, uh, a catastrophic hmm. situation, yes. So we, we, we came back. But but that indebtedness, we still have that, don't we? Yes, government is, and the and president the, mentioned. Yes, some the, payments they, they, they are, will be made and they, all. Yeah, they, they are meeting those. But uh, the concerns really over the computation, uh, for instance, is about our definition of annual salary. SNITs. Uh, defines it differently. Mm. And uh, there is also not sufficient happiness as it computes. Uh, when you are going on pension, 
you only find your 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 money is paid into your account mm -hmm. you don't have a statement that tells you how this has been computed and and that is uh, one of the reasons why uh, labor had to lodge a complaint with the the national pensions regulatory uh, just a minute so i'm referring to I'm, I'm looking at the section in act 766 which provides for the formula for computation of pensions <coughs> uh, mr atakufi here made reference to i just wanted to understand exactly okay. the challenge we have with this if any 77 section 771 says a member may be paid full or reduced pension then two says the minimum pension payment shall be based on 50 percentum of the average annual salary for the three best years of a member's working life. 77.3 says, where a member works beyond the pension payable shall be increased by one and a half percent for every additional 12 months, worked up to a maximum of 80 percent. You think these are not clear enough? Uh, Snate interprets them differently when it comes to uh, computing pensions the it, it uses it doesn't use your it, it defines annual salary differently mm. but annual salary is, is should not be in dispute exactly i'm yes. wondering why that would be yes. a matter yes. of dispute. so so that is essentially uh, and how does it define annual salary snit uses uh, it picks 36 years 36 months, 36 months. Uh, sorry which 36 is, months yeah. uh, and divides by three which comes to 12 which comes to 12 and 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 uses that as your uh, or as an annual salary but that is not annual salary uh, annual salary is defined you may not end that uh, in the whole year mm -hmm. but that is your annual salary and is is the is the is is the figure that must go into the computation very well let me let me come to mr takufi here to pick your brains on this issue the annual salary controversy, if you like. Mr. Abdus is saying SNIT would use, would work based on 36 months and then do uh, divided by 12, <coughs> by three, and then come to 12, which really in normal, in normal English language would amount to an annual salary, looking at how much you earn in 12 months in the year. So why the need to do the 36 and then come to? Well, the, the law says we look at your three best, best three, years yes. throughout your working life. So what SNET will do is to look at, they will cherry pick your best contribution. Uh -huh. Because you see, the SNET scheme is a defined benefit scheme. But it's a defined benefit scheme which is based on contribution. Exactly. Okay. Uh, I mean, in other traditional defined benefit schemes, like for example, in the UK, you don't contribute anything, you know. And then uh, they, they, they look at your your national insurance contribution, you look at your tax, and then all that. How you are for the This is a You look at life average. Here, they look at three benefits. Yeah. Now, people don't retire always at the end of the year. They could retire in January, February, March. Anyway. So when you retire, the point, the end of your working life, SNET will look at your best salaries of country on for 36 months. Mm. So it may not necessarily be January to, to December, but it could be from, say, May 2019 back to May or oh, back to April Three, yes, 2018. Right. And then they, that is presuming those years were your best, best years. years. Okay. It could well be that maybe you, you change jobs and that previous job was even paying you better. So it will go that far back to look at the peaks, the best, and then take the 36 months and then do the computation mm. from there. Okay. okay, so there's an, there's, a, there's an issue about transparency Mr. Abloso raises. Absolutely. Which is, I think it's quite important. It is that important, we deal with that. Exactly. yes. Yeah. And that is why we have given directive to SNET as part of all this discussion that when a person uh, is 57 years, it is best to write to the person, mm -hmm. invite the person in, sit down with them, go through the formula with them. In fact, SNET does that. They say they call it age 54 because some people retire. So we'll call you in, 
and then have a conversation with you about what is going to go into the computation of your salary. And therefore, if, if 77, section 77 has to be explained to you, then it will be done. We have also further given directive that when they hit 59, mm -hmm. call them back in. At 59, you know at least your two best years. That one you know already. Maybe it's your third best year, which probably will still be pending, especially when you are a, a public sector worker where uh, the older you stay at work, the higher your salary gets. Mm. Okay. Then you know that maybe your last year will be one of your... You're going to be working a lot of money. Exactly. <laughs> so that question goes ahead of the person's retirement because... Uh, yes, there's an actuarial basis for the calculation. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a mathematical base for it. Not everybody understands. Yes. So if this is not explained to the person, exactly. but they are told that this is your, this is how much you're going to be paid, then of course it, it, it could lead to a bit of shock. Exactly. I yeah. think that transparency issue it's is really important. important. We need to deal with it. And uh, Mr. Kote, definitely that puts a certain responsibility on labor unions as well to get you know your 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 workers up and doing about that, making them more interested in following up on these things even before they get to their 55s, 57s and all. So actively you are in labor union, I see you and other, you know, unions and um, worker unions. Really and truly is what you put in that you get it out. So the discussion really has to center on exactly how much you're contributing and that comes from salaries. I know the ICU has, has called for a review of the single salary. We'll talk about the bit and, you know, getting your workers <laughs> up and doing about. Thank you. Thank you for that. respective you founded the crusade in delivering our education subjects to the members. A right of that, that this particular BD theme mm -hmm. became more exactly. relevant to us to look at. And yet, the reality that you are going to respond at the end of your journey in working life actually comes up. So, we are doing that really forcefully. And in doing so, we make everybody aware that it is your right to go for your statement. In fact, SNEET has done well, giving almost everybody a biometric card. Mm -hmm. So, now you can access the computer. Okay. So, and then we also encourage you, please keep it slip because in the crunch of it, that is what you can use to work with the We are also there are you can use that and don't make up to it. In that education also, we are making them aware to also deal with the employers because as I mentioned earlier, some employers are not paying exactly So these are the highlights in the education yeah. Apart from emphasizing uh, if you like on this, we like this because a lot of things will change in your in your in your in your budget drastically. And therefore we have seen people dying, we have seen people looking shabbily, and therefore that should be a mirror reflection as to how we behave. This is the communication that is going down together with exposing the art seven senses, the formula as it is. Uh, unfortunately, Greta is saying that the formula is well defined, but we are taking it to the actual scientists who came up with it. This is because there are why didn't they and two. The end will be different. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are the questions that are now coming up. Though we know that SNEED must also have a sustainable funding mm -hmm. to make sure that this pension, the moment you start tomorrow, they won't tell you no money to pay you, exactly. and then that must also go. So, in the in the, in the on this, and the slap and pay the employee by reason of my pensions calculation, because if I'm supposed to have gotten my statutory paid, maybe uh, SNIT gives us 15 uh, days in the ensuing month for us to clear ourselves. If yeah. the employer failed to do that, okay, how does that affect my computation at the sure. end of the year? So sure. we are doing all these things to our members for them to, I mean, just wake up. Right. Normally we find employers getting to the end of the month, they say cash flow challenges, and therefore they only pay the net salary 
Okay? And when the workers get the necessary, they forget about the statutes. But we are saying for the future. These are points that we are giving to members. Very well. I think, uh, hold on to that. We need to take a break. When we come back, then we launch into the single yeah, okay. <laughs> salary um, um, pay structure review and all of that, because that is really a big issue we've been looking at. So let's take a break. When we come back, we delve into the single spine salary and the cost for the review of the pay structure. Welcome back. You're still watching and listening to The Key Points live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and across the world at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we're looking at matters concerning workers and uh, workers' conditions in the country, particularly as we commemorated May Day this week on 1st May 2019, which was just Wednesday gone by. We'll be taking a listen to some reactions to the various speeches that were given at the parade grounds on Wednesday. So we'll take that and then return to the panelists for uh, the conversation to continue. Let's take a listen. We are going around with Senate across the country from 21st of May to open the discussions in the regions as well. And when we gather all these views and we put them together and we work together, we can improve pensions, we can you know, improve uh, what we call lump sum and so on for people who retire in this country under the pension scheme. Government will hold arrears over a period and then if there's a change of government, they tell us we have come to clear all the arrears. Then before he's saying this, you ask yourself, in the last two years, has government made himself clean from snitch? That is also not true. So we believe these rhetoric political statements must die off and let us face the actuals and realities of our time. How can you deduct 82% from uh, a retirees Ben Lamsam when he retires at 40 years. This is not fair to the worker, and this must change. Good, so those were some uh, views from uh, the p people who were in attendance. Obviously, you saw Mr. Kote there speaking. You saw yourself there, didn't you? <laughs> so you because you so much into the conversation about the single spine yes. um, salary uh, pay structure and all. Let's go there. But I know you have an issue about the basic salary and that concerns you as well. We need to look at. So please, let's have your perspective. You're calling for a review of that. Yes, yeah. you, you'll agree with me that uh, in 2004, when we had His Excellency uh, uh, before, <clears throat> he made a very interesting statement that Pretty workers seem to be working <laughs> and governments will pretend to be paying. And that time, Dr. Pakwisi Doom was at the Ministry of Finance and Planning in that order. So the single price salary thing started from that point. And you'll agree with me that they noticed that the levels of salary being paid was not the best. That informed it. Then in addition, they also tried to synchronize your first degree holder and first degree holder. When they came to a huge from the basic pay to advances and Interview. So it was all come on board and then they started their work. At the time, as if it was calculated, it was the police service who were first to jump okay. onto the single spine. And that it was, was cool. mass jubilation. It was mass jubilation. <laughs> but it's like with the influx of time, the values have eroded. And the same level of pay that could not meet the exigencies and the needs of the time, okay, the current levels that are being paid have also found itself in that same situation. So obviously, one will say, uh, are we better off than what we were or now? What is it? But we, you, I mean, you're talking about the rationale or the objective of the single spine uh, salary pay or pay policy. You talk about everything, but you left out the part about the linkage of pay to productivity because yes. that remains a key issue. Yes, we have uh, advocated that there's no way two working classes of people in different jobs will earn the same salary, even though we have the same degree. Because if I work in a more risky environment, I may get a risk allowance of a sort, whilst yours isn't so. so in aggregate, okay, what would come as my net pay will be different for what comes sure. to have your net pay. But trying to say that a degree holder everywhere should have the same basic salary, that in itself also is a challenge. Mm. But the single span have tried to synchronize and bring that harmony in, in a very good way. But just because the the kind of increases we are seeing are at a tortoise pace, that they are not so relevant, and therefore it's like what 
was herald at the time is no more nothing to actually be happy about. So we are thinking that, fine, the structure should be there, but can we re-engineer it again and look at the values that are paid as of now? Because seriously speaking, if we look at the cost of living in this country now, these things are not really there to support the realities. That is why we are advocating that. Let's do some re-engineering and then have the levels, you know, change either across board or in a kind of a, a salary a programming that will help us get the people who are earning it and yes. then that will be good. Very well. Ms. Abloso, yeah. your, your, your thoughts on um, the, the call for the single spine uh, salary review? Certainly for, for every policy uh, that's in place, for a while. periodically you need to look at uh, whether it's serving its purpose, what impact it's having uh, on industry and on, on the government purse. But it's a welcome policy. It's a very welcome policy that needs to be sustained. Uh, the question is whether the economic fundamentals now can support it. Uh, support it. So that is why uh, a review uh, is important. Uh, the government, when campaigning, was telling us workers were suffering, pensioners were suffering. Uh, there's been no significant change in the level of suffering. And in fact, in Ghana, what we don't talk about is that pensioners are deep in the poverty bracket. But when we're discussing poverty and the, and the, the spread of policy, we don't mention uh, pensioners. And it's important that we lift them out of poverty and, and let people look forward to retiring with a lot of hope. Elsewhere in other economies, uh, people are very happy proceeding on pension. Sure. Uh, a brother Kote will tell you uh, members of the, of the union who are proceeding on uh, a pension, when you read their body language, they are terribly af afraid mm. of the prospect of pension. This is what needs to be changed mm. and, and why the uh, review of the single span pay policy, particularly for the public sector, is important. But you see, uh, for instance, there are workers in the Ministry of Education and then there are workers in the Ghana Revenue Authority, same qualification. But if we are not careful, for instance, because those in the Ministry of Education don't generate cash revenue, we might think that their contribution uh, to the national economy is, is, is not that tangible. And it, th those are some of the issues that are important that we look at. But are the K KPI set for respective sectors so that you're able to objectively assess yes there are and it's important that mm. we, we stick to this and and, and not let uh, like not rubbish uh, demands by those who don't who don't whose work doesn't end up in uh, uh, in in quantifiable like cash, cash. Okay. yes very well cash and, and very well I, 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 I think we can also begin to look at the management of, of the pension funds which has become an issue, and, and, and questions raised about how well we are managing it to be able to make pensions sustainable is, is an issue. I want you to take that, Mr. Takufi. You, you do know that consistently, consistently, SNIT is involved in one scandal or the other, the allegations here and there, raising, raising <laughs> issues. Where trade unions would, co would come up <laughs> a whole lot of issues, you know, word. and then making workers and you know potential yeah. or prospective pensioners very worried about how well their their, their contributions have been managed. Yeah. Okay, uh, I mean I will answer that for mm. you. But let me <laughs> let me let me let me come back to the issue that Seth raised uh, uh, because I think salaries, low salaries are. Uh, an issue which we are all having to deal mm. with, and, and Solomon also reached that uh, from the single spine over the years. Maybe value of money has gone down, therefore, maybe we need to have a look at uh, how people are paid. But the law on pensions 
uh, states very clearly the percentage of your salary mm -hmm. that should go into pension. So if your salary is low, definitely You're going to get your contribution like, yeah. is going to be low. But there is one bit of it which we haven't fully utilized, which is the fact that you can contribute up to 35% of your salary, if you can afford it, but 35% into pensions without any tax deduction. Mm -hmm. Okay, only 11% goes into SNET, we all know, and 5% of your contribution will go into your uh, uh, lump, uh, lump sum payment, which is your occupational pension uh, scheme. There is an extra, uh, okay, 2.5% will go to NHIA mm. for, for our health benefits, but there's an extra 16.5% which we are not utilizing. The good thing that are as beginning to emerge, and I, I will, I will uh, entreat ICU to take up that uh, opportunity because a lot of um, unions are setting up their own provident fund for their members. Mm -hmm. This is in addition to your occupational pension scheme, your tier two. They're taking up uh, the, 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 the tier three provident well, fund. We, we have it. Absolutely. Okay. If you do, then, then, then uh, uh, that's excellent. If you don't, it's something that needs to be done. A whopping 16.5%, that can be added. So you go on pension, you have three levels of pension to take. Your monthly pension, which is will the provide to you, one. Mm -hmm. and then your lump sum from your tier two, and then your top up from your tier three, which is your provident fund. And I think people can then me, go me, on pension and retire a little bit happier yeah, not than, than they are now. Yeah. <laughs> But coming back... I'll come uh, to you, Mr. Kose, for that, yes. Coming back to the uh, uh, how pension funds yeah, are managed. being invested or being managed, of course, yeah. I mean, tier one is publicly managed by SNET. So they do the investment, they do the custody, and then they do the payout. Uh, tier two is privately managed. So you choose your own pension fund administrator. Right. Who then uh, appoint the pension fund manager and then the custodian. <coughs> okay. But the rules as to how pension funds must be invested are very, very strict. Very, very strict. And that is the provision is made in the law. And MPRA, we, uh, uh, we have an investment guideline uh, which has been gazetted since 2017, mm. which is very, very clear and emphatic on where pension funds can be invested. Okay. For example, it is only in government bonds and long-term securities that you can invest up to 60% mm. of pension funds. We can also invest in corporate bonds. You can invest in uh, uh, equities. You can invest in even, we have introduced private equities as well, mm. which is a smaller percentage of it. You can invest in money market. So there are seven categories of areas. Beyond that, you cannot invest pension funds and there are strict rules on on, on, on on compliance we visit we check we look at your custodian uh, report to make sure that all your investment are within even the limits you cannot exceed a certain limit for example if you're going to go into equities and shares it has to be 35 percent mm -hmm. for example if you're going to go into corporate bonds it has to be 25 percent for example and all those things are are checked so you cannot and and, and touch wood they, i mean that's why i said scandal is a big word it's a huge area yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> i mean when we have seen a number of banks gone down but you've never seen a, or heard the fact that the pension funds have been lost mm. because there is prudent management there are strict rules mm. and because they're shaking his head yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not him. because even if you look yeah. at certain I, 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 yeah, yeah you can if yes. you look at the law the law makes provision that even if a bank goes down and the bank is a custodian pension funds are first to be secured so mm. we have banks like unibank going down they were all custodians but not a single pension fund has been lost. Mm. So in terms of management of pension funds, we have been very prudent and we are sure and touch wood that will not happen. That the guidelines are yeah, adhered to strictly. Now, Mr. Mr. Kose, you were shaking your head clearly in, 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 in disagreement. What, what's, your, what's your disagreement? Because we have carried some, uh, some exercise, okay, mm -hmm. looking at the second tier management, you know, funds and so on. He's mentioned the levels of investment currently right. as it stands, but I beg to differ mm. because what we found on the ground uh, go far uh, vitiating from what he had actually said. We also noticed that there are records and statements. Confirm. Yes, I will, I, will, I will give you the report. I will give you because our report. For us as regulators, it's very important yeah. that sure. if, you, if you find anything, bring it to our attention. Well, we'll, and then that's we'll my question, that have you, have you drawn the NPRA's no, attention? We but we went there for a conversation. My team came to you. 
Okay. Three of them they came to you for a discussion. They came. On, on this particular yes, matter. on this particular matter. Okay. Our report will be up. For we we will come out openly mm -hmm. to do it out. Yes, you are not aware. Okay. So that one will come out. I think yes, it will be important to, yes. to, yeah. to, to bring it to their attention. It's the essence of the exercise because it will come at his doorpost at the end of the day. Now uh, we know that maybe we we'll say there are teething stages at the time that these farm managers took over and whatever, whether they are uh, applying themselves fully to the dictates of the law that has brought them into being. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure we also police them and that they do the right thing so that at the end of the day, the essence for which the uh, uh, funds okay. were invested, we get the returns as it is. So we, we will bring that to you formally. Okay. Now, you mentioned the issue of uh, productivity and salaries. Yes. I mean, it, the correlation is still there all the time. That is why the, the 651 uh, says that equal work for equal pay. So we can do different work and then uh, we earn the same salary. No, that no, is No, but not. equal work for equal pay is different from ensuring that this productivity, I mean, in terms of the worker giving off, you know, a certain expected performance to merit a certain level of salary. So that one, it depends on the employer and the kind of management skill they have. Because people are supposed to clock in 8 o'clock and they don't do that and there are no punitive measures to them and you leave them to go. It doesn't affect them in any way. And then two, uh, the KPIs that are set for them, are they meeting it? The kind of support they need to meet the KPIs, are they also available? Like a driver who comes to work and they say no battery. So he sits down the whole day. You can't charge him and say you have not met your KPI. Or a nurse who comes to work, like we saw at a psychiatric hospital where there were no gloves, no pencils, and they started, they didn't work. You can't say that productivity has suffered because they have refused to work. We always want to link it to <coughs> what is there to, the make them, to, yes, work, to, to, to make them work. And in God Government circles, especially, these are where you find those like. But trust me, we are very, you know, uh, big in the private sector. You will see these challenges over there. The private employer will make sure that, okay, I have the resources, I have the tools. But that's exactly the point. The concern now has to do with, you know, the public sector where over, is it 90% of the revenue we get going to payment of wages and salaries? And that's where the concern is. So if we're paying so much, we would expect some commensurate, you know, returns in terms of productivity. So that's what I'm saying. Then the supervisory work over there must be strong. Mm. You see, when you supervise, there's, there are punitive measures that comes also along with it. If, if you don't meet target, you must be brought to book. If you work in late or you take this off without you know, properly being granted permission, <laughs> it must be deducted from your salary. Unions don't just support you know, workers who don't apply themselves to the rules of, 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 of work. And therefore, we think if government really want to succeed in that area, mm then the training that must go to the supervisors must be clear and then the workers must also understand even when it comes to issues of appraiser mm -hmm. somebody who have not even come to work a whole year mm -hmm. and, uh, what do you call it a whole period of uh, one month yet in appraiser nothing shows there nothing reflects there so they will take it for granted but you won't get this in the private sector so <laughs> governments will learn how efficient the private sector had been on the score of its productivity and then bring that reflection back you know to the public sector because what we are all seeing in this country the essentials of the public sector cannot be overemphasized without them government simply cannot work yes. without them a lot of things cannot go in uh, but i said was just saying that uh, if you look at issues of productivity okay and uh, you walk into an office, you only want a file, and it will take three days mm -hmm. for the file to be retrieved. You ask yourself, what is the person doing over there? You get in the government sector, no light, okay, prepaid. That is the PDS have taken it off, and they sit down, nothing really happens. And they said, our budget allocation is finished, nothing has come, okay? That is why we believe that government must also look at how much support they are giving to the state institutions okay i do a lot of work with labor commission some time ago we walk in there for the commission city no light okay and therefore no work and then everybody goes back and they meet once in a month okay uh, once in a month and if this thing continue like this then pile up of cases and it brings unnecessary pressure so government must also look uh, quick and deep so that the so budget allocation on yes. both sides, government must look go, within, yes. workers also look within. So they shouldn't look best. just at the workers, but okay. it must look what they must also do mm. to enable you know these controls to be brought you know in, 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 in very well. Maybe Ms. Abla, so I, I heard you make a remark, well, not loud enough, when the issue about management of pension funds came mm. in. You, let me hear you on that. You're concerned about that. Uh, concerned about that is that the problems we've had 
border on mismanagement mm -hmm. and political interference. Uh, some of the issues of mismanagement are scandalous, and evidence of this is available. In fact, in 2017, the organization I, I work with, Labor Policy International, made available copies of the forensic audit of SNIT, on SNIT conducted in the year uh, 2001. We made it available to the NPRA. And the NPRA is a, a unique and welcome institution that has come into pension management. Mm -hmm. We made this available to pension. And the, the, the scandals in that, in that report are frightening. In fact, the city equivalent that had been misapplied or stolen in that report goes up then to uh, close to 20 billion cities. There is also the dollar equivalent over 20 million US dollars. There's a Dutch mark equivalent that after. Now, we, we ask the NPRA to work to retrieve these monies, but we haven't seen action on that since 2017. And copies of this was made available to the president to organize labor to the Ministry of Employment and Labor, to the Finance Ministry. Uh, nothing has been done. In 2004, the then Serious Fraud Office also conducted forensic audit on SNET. They came up with startling revelations. In fact, on, on, on one portfolio, they presented a docket to the Attorney General for, for, prosecution. for prosecution. Nothing was done. All these monies are drained on the fund and, and impact negatively on pensions because they are not available mm. to be invested. Right. Yes. And even before then, you remember Komala Dumont and uh, Multimedia mm. had taken SNIT to mm. charge. Mm. And the report is available. The revelations in there are frightening. So it's important that we have a prudent uh, management of the funds. And as these reports go, even as we retrieve these monies, it's important that we apply Section 186 of the Companies Code, which bars persons involved in issues of fraud from managing companies right. or taking public office. But I'm saying in this report that individuals and companies have been clearly identified mm. as being involved in, mm. in, in Mismanagement of, 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 of such of funds. But, uh, so I, I come back to you, Mr. Taktofi. When you hear such, you know, um, remarks, what, what 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 does that say to you? Because you, yes, you 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 made it seem as though I mean, every there are strict guidelines that ensure that you know people managing f pension funds adhere to these st strict guidelines. But clearly, uh, that isn't exactly what the situation is. Well, but they, they're making references to reports and, you know, Shraj reports and all. We do know about the Shraj report on SNIT and all of that. Yeah. And, and, and so if we don't see any punitive measures being taken in respect of such, you know, yeah. actions, then uh, people would always worry about how well their, uh, you know, funds are managed. Well, I cannot say that there haven't been any issues in the past. And certainly the agitation of 2004 would have been coming from some of these issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you, you make reference to the forensic audit of 2001, yeah. for example, which over the years has not been dealt with. So maybe mm -hmm. uh, the issues were all that brought the need for reform and the, also the need to create a regulator to come into existence to make sure that these things do not happen you know, going forward. MPRA was set up in 2010, effectively, you know, 2011, we started staffing and, you know, uh, and then we needed to go through education and sensitization. We, I mean, and then 
the regulation, setting up of schemes in tier two and tier three. And now we've just about, you know, uh, formalized ourselves to regulate SNIT. We are in a position to regulate SNIT effectively. We are looking at their, their management accounts. And we they, they, there's a history that we need to work from. Yes, I mean, but also deal with. Yeah, and deal with. Yeah. Exactly. So so these are some of the issues that have come to our, to our table. Uh, the report that you're referring to, I have seen it. You know, I have seen that report, but not as not uh, as far back as 2017, as you're saying. I mean, I don't know, uh, but it has been a copy of it has been given to me as at our last board meeting by Mr. Tinkran. Yeah, he nice. gave me a copy. So I will, I will attest to that for that. We've seen it, and it's on my table. And then we will need to look at it and deal with all the issues that, that, that are in there. So uh, it's worrying uh, when you when you hear some of these things. Mm -hmm. But we want to make sure that uh, the uh, as, as slave regulation. And make sure that there's prudence in how pension funds are managed, there's prudence in how SNE themselves conduct uh, uh, transparency and trust yeah. back into the industry right. for, for the benefit of members. Sure. So uh, I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm very worried or concerned about how we deal with the past, you know, issues yeah. because clearly, <coughs> yes, moving forward, we may have the guidelines and everything, yeah. but how we deal with events of the past Absolutely. can actually shape what happens, what you know, happens uh, today. And exactly, because then if there's no deterrence in the system, many people will just, you know, go well, ahead and, are, and have a field day. There are people who are who are in court over, over our SNIT issues. Mm. So these are some of the things we v cannot... Very mean, well. Yeah. Very well. Now, um, I'll be... I'll be Picking comments from uh, you know um, our viewers and listeners, but I would want us to look at one thing that the president said, and, and still on you, Mr. Takofi. Yeah. Um, the president, if I may read his statement, I've highlighted that here. He says, "I acknowledge that there are unresolved issues with the Social Security and National Insurance Trust, uh, SNIT, and the NPRA." He's I've asked the Minister for Employment and Labour Relations to liaise with SNIT and NPRA to bring finality to all outstanding issues in the next three months. So. Within the next three months, there's a whole lot of things there's that needs the, to yeah, be done. That's how much in orders. The pressure is on. Exactly. Yeah. So you need to, you know. Absolutely. It's, it's marching time now. We've started even. Very well. And I know one of these outstanding issues has to do with the unification of all pension schemes. That, 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 that is an outstanding issue. It isn't, isn't an outstanding issue. It is a, a provision of the law. Which, is, which hasn't which been, has implemented. been implemented. So it's yeah. still an, it's an outstanding yeah. one. Because there was a time frame within which... Yeah. Those those it provisions. Been, it should have been at 2014. Exactly, and so it remains. It is an outstanding issue. How are we doing on that? Well, again, it's a it's a it's a provision mm -hmm. in the in the Act, Act 766. Yes, Act 766, which NPRA needs to deal with. Uh, we have to engage the stakeholders because if you look at the provision, uh, mm -hmm. at, uh, at section 218, if you have it in front of you, you can look at that. It gives a whole list of parallel pension schemes that were operating prior to the coming into force of Act 76. Yes. And the law says that after four years, all those schemes are supposed to have come to an end right. and everybody will come under seven sixes. Okay. Now, the question is whether as at two th the end of 2014, all those schemes then cease automatically or somebody has to go to court mm -hmm. to implement that mm -hmm. or indeed uh, a new law will have to be uh, uh, enacted mm -hmm. to do that or not. That is a matter which our lawyers are looking at. We are looking at the legal implication of it. And the, and the reason why this is, 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 a, is a great concern has to do with the, the fact that the, it creates inequity, inequity, exactly, in the system. Yeah. I mean, you, you have people who are not contributing but are drawing from it, clearly. Every man, every man government has to look for in excess of 120 million to mm. pay for uh, for uh, the pensions of, of people in this category who haven't contributed. Yeah, and they are drawing the pensions. Of the I, 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 will, I will take <laughs> I will take ICU's <laughs> comments on this issue, the unification of pension schemes and how how it is that it remains an outstanding issue. But let me take messages or contributions from our listeners and viewers. This one is coming in from Comrade Haya. He's in Shai Usudoku. He says, it's obvious this government has lost touch with the worker 
upon all the sweet and juicy promises made during the electioneering uh, period. This year's May Day celebration was not patronized, but was rather characterized by spots of demonstrations because the worker couldn't bear it anymore. Ali Foster in Bibini says, I think it is only fair we Ghanaians give President Mohammed thumbs up for re-echoing re the true picture of what the mass uh, the masses are going through on the quiet, of which the civil society groups refused or uh, are failing to talk about. God bless President Mohammed and bless Ghana. Aziz John La Inwa says, the celebration of May Day is not actually necessary to me because the condition of service is not responding well to the citizenry. Government must upgrade the system, especially the pension scheme. Pensioners are suffering a lot. I contribute 86 Ghana cities every month. However, with the development at SNIT, I don't uh, wait to retire. I don't want to retire anytime soon. Now that's another thing. So contribution of 86 Ghana cities. I mean that really get you. is, this is big. anyways. <laughs> so I, I had is it the director general who in an interview was saying the lowest um, pensions uh, yes was 300 months. 300. That is but, just but not nobody so receives less than, than nobody receives less than a uh, 300. Mm -hmm. Nobody receives less than the minimum wage. So there is a social security element there to bump people up so that nobody falls below. So even with the, the bumping up, we have that. Absolutely, oh because goodness. the contribution the contribution on it is very minimal. Right. Okay. Very very minimal. Uh, there are about 80 percent of people who are contributing on less than a thousand Ghana cities. You know, and when you take 11 percent of that what you are putting in is very, very minimal. Very and well. that is meant to be turned around through investment. Mm. And you cannot pay anybody below the minimum wage. Sure. So in that sense, from the lower end, SNIT is, 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 is having to you know, take up sure a responsibility. Up a bit. Well, yes. very well. Let me carry on with the messages. This is um, Isaac Nidote Kuma in Tema. He says, good morning, Abna. The management of SNIT uh, are the killers of workers in Ghana. They pay themselves fat salaries. Well, these are serious allegations you're making um, but essentially I think your concern has to do with how well um, pension funds are managed. Um, Blueprint in Esikado Ketan says what has happened to the committee's report on SNIT which um, interprets what constitutes annual salary, early retirement reduction factor and annuity factor on lump sum which ultimately affects the contributor. Has SNIT been able to detect all the flaws and the, you say, is that cheats in the schemes? Uh, they should not be interested in collection, but mode of fairly distributing what they get. Um, this one says, good morning. Um, you're talking about SNIT for workers. What of us casual workers in public service? What happens to my money if um, the unfortunate thing happens and I am sacked? because I have been a casual worker for four years now, and some of my co colleagues are five, six, seven, eight years now. No mechanization, and the labor law says after six months, uh, they should be mechanized. I don't, okay, so in, in terms of after six months, you, be, you, are, you are deemed to be a permanent, permanent staff. But, but, but even if you're a casual is, worker, they're supposed to pay pensions, yes. your, your, your pension contribution. Yes. So they need to inform MPRA if their employer is not paying their contribution. Right. And then we will send our compliance officers on Sure. That. But that is another issue too, yeah. the casualization. Of, of exactly, that's, 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 that's another issue we, we will need to look at at another time. Um, Dr. Bob in Boko says, how can our pension fund be managed prudently uh, when a labor working in SNIT is paid more than a director in the public or civil service? Okay, that I'm not sure about. SNIT is a killer organization. It is only in Ghana that workers are forced to join a social or pension scheme. Even in our brother country, Nigeria, workers choose their own personal pension schemes immediately they are employed. I know of a worker who had 20,000 after working for 35 years. I know of a watchman with SNIT who bought two SNIT houses through deductions from his salary. This is not fair to contributors. We must, as a country, take a second look at the work of SNIT. Um, Bonnie from Akachi says, workers work and contribute to SNIT and at retirement they go home with something little. Politicians stay in office for four years and take home mouth-watering benefits while they don't even contribute to SNITs, I guess. Okay, you need to verify that. Workers need to be treated well. That's Bonnie in Akachi. Let me take the last one here. Good morning. Um, keep on actually delve into issues arising in Ghana, but please may I know what is considered as a minimum contribution of a Ghanaian worker to SNIT. So clearly the messages coming in are hitting hard at SNITs. 
uh, people not obviously happy about that. Mr. Atta Kufi. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, 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 I've heard you very well. And again, I think it's, it's down to the fact that uh, there's lack of uh, education and sensitization on what SNIT does and, 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 and what goes into our pension contributions and our pension payment. So definitely a lot of work will need to be done. And here I will, I will plead with the unions who represent these workers' interests to organize a lot of uh, uh, fora and yeah. education. I mean, I, the, the, the general secretary was saying, the secretary general was saying that they, they're going around the country with SNIT MPRA will also be there, where the, um, opportunities will be given for people to ask questions and, and, and a lot of explanation be given, because it, it boils down to, to people understanding mm. what the social security that we are contributing to is all about. Well, and how I mean, well it's I mean, managed I, 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 If I heard it right, one of them was, uh, one of your text uh, messages was saying that Smith, <laughs> Uh, uh, workers don't even contribute to SNIT, I mean, these are <laughs> which, is, which is not, no, <laughs> yeah, which is yeah. not true. So all sorts of you know a lot of that out to there. Be but yeah, we that. need to take a break. When we come back, we'll wrap up on the conversation here. You're watching the key points. Stick and stay with us. We'll be right back. Great, so you're still watching and listening to The Key Points. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page at TV3 Ghana. We're wrapping up on the conversation here, uh, looking at the May Day celebrations, the significance of May Day celebrations, the work, workers' conditions in Ghana and what can be done about it, but also focusing particularly on pensions. This year's May Day celebrations theme was sustainable pensions, the role of is it social partners, I believe. Yes, so we're looking at that. I'll come to you, Mr. Abloso, here okay. for your, you know, conclusion remarks and uh, as we go along. You have a minute and 30 seconds to do that. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Let me, let me quickly draw attention to uh, a quote from a paper that His Eminence B.J. Darocha, uh, a paper that he presented on legislative elects in 2000. He says, it's up to the workers on whose behalf money is paid to the fund to wake up to the fact that the money in the fund is this. The management of SNIT should be interminably reminded that the money in the fund is trust money, which must be managed, invested, and spent exclusively for the benefit of those on whose behalf it is paid. And he adds, unless this is done, SNIT will continue to spend money in the uncontrolled manner it is doing now. This is 2000. Mm. In the end, it is the workers and society generally who will suffer. suffer. Quickly, uh, in Parliament as well in... When was it? In Parliament as well in 2015, this is what the Harry Nedrusu is quoted in the hands that are saying. I note in particular that the actual study which was done kind of put SNET in some danger. If we did not make one or two major decisions, we could endanger the scheme going into a decade or more, three decades forward. And this is a statement he made on 27th May 2015. Clearly, there are problems with SNET. But it's a potentially good institution. And I don't share the view that references to Nigeria that let everybody, ch every worker yeah. choose where he wants to go. Uh, and SNIT's monopoly on the first year is something we need to maintain. Okay. But ensure that, like the Nigerians say, let our money work for us. Mm. Yes. Very well. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Kote. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Even though SNIT has come to the spotlight today, <laughs> one should not also forget the good work that they've done over the period, the circumstances they find themselves, an institution where government intervention, rightly or wrongly, have been the order of the day, where government arrears, okay, could also run huge. We are talking about 1.8 billion now. So they also suffer a lot of uh, setbacks. We want to encourage all those who have raised concerns that these are perceptions, that if they can have the opportunity, either visit the MPRA, they have a complaint desk, they will listen, more or less, they are down the watchdogs over the SNIT itself, and mm -hmm. then they'll be listening, and then these issues can be addressed. But waiting, and then uh, maybe 
instituting these things in programs and sessions like this, it may not also help us. But we are we are thankful to you because some of the issues you have raised, we may also carry it sure. and then take it. And finally, the boss himself is here. <laughs> uh, he was nodding and jotting some things. Up. But <laughs> let's encourage all who could not get the opportunity to put up their issues here, to visit the offices. We are Ghanaians. We must be patriotic. We must push the agenda forward. My brother just said, without the first year, the risk for all Ghanaians in future will be in a serious mess. So sure. let's uphold what we have and continue to do the corrections. And we'll Very well. Mr. Setup, so behind the scenes indicated that perhaps one of the good things that has happened to pension management in the country is the setting up of the NPRA. Indeed, I think that 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 that, that is this, that is true. Uh, so I give you your, the last word, Mr. Okay. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a good opportunity. And let me also associate with my two other panelists for the comments that they have made. Uh, NPRA, um, maybe until the pension issues came to the fore, a lot of people don't even know that SNIT is regulated mm -hmm. or indeed regulated by the National Pensions Regulatory Authority. And that is also the, the, the first point of call when there are any issues, if there if indeed there are, uh, to, to come to if your employer is not paying your social security pensions or not paying your tier, tier two pensions or for some reason have stopped paying, NPRA is where you have to come to and uh, we are always there and available for the benefit of contributors and members. So let, let us all learn about the, the existence of NPRA from here. I mean in terms of SNIT, making sure that SNIT is solvent and SNIT is, is managing our funds prudently, every three years there is an actuarial valuation where we look at uh, essentially the health status of SNIT mm. so that we know how the funds are being used and whether maybe in, in 10, 20, 40 years the fund will be there at all. And we have to work towards what can be done to sustain the funds over right. a period of time. And I do know that people want more payouts, but payouts also depends on what yeah. you pay in. Right. and then also investment as a function of it. Right. So we all have to work and put our hands on the deck and put our, our, our shoulders to the wheel, as we say, yeah. uh, to make sure that the SNIT as a, as a scheme is sustained. sustainable. Very well. Um, let's keep the engagement going. But my personal plea to you, NPRA, is please take a look at the reports that have been Absolutely. put on the table, as, as suggested by um, Mr. Kote and Mr. Abloso here. But thank you so much uh, for, you know, tuning in and listening to us on the first segment of the show, which uh, looked at the May Day celebrations, looking at issues concerning workers, workers' conditions, pensions, and many other issues. The panelists that had the conversation here with me have been from my left, Mr. Solomon Kotoe. He is the General Secretary of the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union. It, we've also had Mr. Hayford Atakrufi. He is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Pensions Regulatory Authority, NPRA, and Mr. Seth Abloso, who is a Labour Consultant. We'll be back shortly to look at World Press Freedom Day. Stick and stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching and listening to The Key Points. We are live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7, and around the world at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So just going by with a conversation around May Day celebrations. Now we are turning our attention to press freedom. And yesterday, Ghana joined the rest of the world to commemorate World Press Freedom Day. And we have in the studio here, um, from my extreme left, Professor Audrey Gajapo. She is the Dean of the School of Information and Communication Studies at the University of Ghana, Lagan. Next to her is Mr. Elvis Darko. He is the editor of the Finder newspaper. And to my right, we have Mr. Martin Pibu, who is a lawyer. Good morning, lady and gentlemen. Good it's good to have you here to, to you know, have this very important conversation but before we launch into that in studio let's take a quick look or listen to um the president of the ghana journalist association in the person of mr afel money and also the deputy minister for information mr pius hajide as they made statements on the day commemorating world press freedom day and then we return to the panelist in studio let's take a listen condemn the threats and robbery perpetrated against the reporter as we urge the national security to move with urgent promptitude to provide all the protection he desperately needs. As a country, 
we are making steady progress towards a conducive environment for the practice of journalism. From the liberalization of the media space, to the repeal of the criminal libel laws, to the recent passage of the Right to Information Act, and let me inform that the Ministry of Information has already begun consultations towards the development of an implementation roadmap, and we count on the support of the media in this regard. The protection of media for this government and under this dispensation is also about to witness a boost with the introduction of a national coordinating mechanism on the safety of journalists. And this must happen under the minister's instructions before July. Great. So those were the two, um, Mr. Afel Moni and Mr. Pius Hajide, speaking in commemoration of World Press Freedom Day yesterday. I'll start a conversation here with you, um, Prof. Um, tell us, you know, just launch us off with an appreciation. Let us appreciate what press freedom is about, why it is that it is even necessary for us to commemorate that day. In my introduction earlier, I stated that, well, for some people, maybe because they were not you know privileged to have had the experience of some time back they wouldn't necessarily understand why it is that we're making you know a big deal about this but for people who experienced certain periods of our political history or national history they would understand that and th that is why i'm asking if you could share that so that everybody we are on the same page we get to know exactly why it is that we are even talking about this day the essence of it so if you could Sure. not just in that direction. Sure, and I think your perspective is a very important one, that we came from a long period of uh, state monopoly, mm -hmm. virtual state monopoly of media, and very restrictive space for media to operate, and therefore no press freedoms. But we know that since 1993, when we began the Fourth Republic, mm -hmm. there's been a lot more press freedom. Right. And press freedom is extremely important because it stems out of our own fundamental freedoms of speech and of association. And, and, and therefore, once you have a, a regime or an environment where press freedom is restricted, mm. you see that individual freedom of speech is also restricted because the press acts as a proxy for for the public. We can't all, as ordinary members of the public, go out there and, and, and shout so that everybody mm. listens to us on important issues. Or ask questions. Or ask questions or hold governments accountable. accountable in an organized manner. So the press does that for mm. us. So it's really important for us to, to support and maintain press freedom. And I think you're right when you stated that perhaps in your intro you, you, you talked about people taking it for granted mm -hmm. because some people have been born in the age of press freedom yep. or were too young to appreciate when we didn't have press freedom. And there's a way in which when we become used to a dispensation, we take it for granted. And it's only when that is taken away, those rights that we take for granted is taken away from us, that we begin to wake up and realize how important it is. Mm. So I think that it's Press Freedom Day has to be commem comm commemorated all of the time, and we need to be reminded about the important place that the press holds, and press meaning media, and even our own freedoms, because these days with social media mm. and citizen journalists, we are all part of right. that huge um, right. group of gathering information and news that is important to us in the development of our country. Right, and keeping government on its toes, work, yeah. work, working as the watchdog over government. Elvis, I'll, I'll come to you as well. Um, press Freedom Day, what does it mean to you as a media practitioner? And what, what are your views about how far we've come as a country in that regard, in, in, in achieving press freedom, which we celebrate today? Well, okay, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I might say that as a journalist, uh, I value press freedom very much, but I'll open my discussion with this quote from what happened in the Pentagon Papers in the United States of America mm. when the New York Times decided to expose the lies the American government was telling the people about the progress they were making 
in the war in Vietnam. And when they published the first story, the U.S. government decided to use law to stop them, and therefore they had to go to the Supreme Court for interpretation. And the one by history, but I'm fascinated by the pronouncement by Justice Hugo Black. Mm. And I think that this gives a greater perspective of what really press freedom is, what really we journalists stand for, or the media stand for, about press freedom. And he says that in the First Amendment, the Founding Fathers gave the free press the protection it must have to fulfill its essential role in our democracy. The press was to serve the governed and not the governors. The government's power to censor the press was abolished so that the press would remain forever free to ensure to censor the government. The press was protected so that it could bear the secrets of government and inform the people. Only a free, unrestrained press can effectively expose the deception in government. And this is Justice Hugo Black mm. in the New York Times versus the State of America. So for me, the worst over there is that the media or the press is to serve the government and not the government. And the, only a free and unrestrained press can expose the deception of government. So when you look at the situation in Ghana and where we have come from, and today, basically, legally, we really don't have any law that really restrained the media from its work. And therefore, I will say that legally, you realize that we have come far in terms of what the press freedom should be. But in and if terms you should, of if you practice, should add the RTI Act to it, that's the cherry that, on top. Yeah, of <laughs> course, of course, that's another idea. But then when you come to the practice of the profession, you realize that uh, people in this country, a lot, a lot of people, do not see why the media should go to all that extent to be exposing the deception of public officials. And therefore, sometimes you realize that some of these people will rather attack the media for doing their work just because they are trying to expose the deception of the public. And I think that that is where we need to focus attention now. For the legal regime, we are fine, but then the attack on media, the media in general, is something that we as a people should take a look at because if so I people... you think there's a misconception on the part of certain, you know, citizens who don't, who think maybe the media would go out of bounds to do certain things? Is that what you're suggesting? That, that, that is how I see because if we are saying that a free press that is not restrained is the one that can expose government deception, people must understand that what the media does is always to tell the truth. To make sure that if something is going wrong, something that should not be done is happening, mm. is the duty of the media to go to the extent of exposing that for the general public to know that, oh, this thing that is happening shouldn't have been the case, but somebody is doing it mm. secretly and it's against the people of Ghana. But unfortunately, in recent times, you realize that the media has come under a certain attack, physical attack, especially by security agencies. Even ordinary people sometimes can just descend on people, journalists or media practitioners, and I just beat them up just because they are trying to do something that somebody thinks that people must not know. Mm. And therefore, they are, their effort to bring it to bear becomes a problem. And I think that in this current dispensation, the legal issues of somebody using law to say you can't do this or it's not the problem anymore but the problem we have now is to get the citizens to understand that whatever the media is doing it is in the interest of the general public and therefore the the decision or the actions that they take in attacking media houses and individuals it's not the best and we must encourage people to refrain from that because we need the public support to be able to hold the government accountable or expose the deception of government yeah. without the public support we cannot continue to do this in the kind of re situation we are finding ourselves in currently. Because if you look at the past two, three years, for instance, a lot of reports about journalists being beaten, being so attacked, we'll be, we'll be even looking. people going to court just to cover suspects being taken to the court for prosecution, mm. and then their families and people will just descend on the media practitioner and attack them. And I think that we'll be looking at the all those, so we yes, look we'll be looking at the challenges that you know media practitioners face in in their practice and all of that. But I think another point that I flagged for further interrogation has to do with what you said earlier about the the role of the media to tell the truth and whether or not that is actually what is done. 
because that is the standard. But whether or not it happens is another thing we'll be looking at into some detail. So I've noted that now we'll be looking at. But Mr. Kwebu, yes. I see you referring to the Constitution, of course. Mm. Um, Professor Gadibu has yeah. taken us back to the, you know, coming into being of the, of the, of the 1992 Constitution mm. and what has happened post that, yeah. you know, promulgation. Yeah. We do enjoy some rights there, mm -hmm. which advances the cause of, you know, um, and press freedom and all of that. Tell us the, 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 the impact of press freedom on democracies. Let us understand that within the context of how the Constitution, you know, makes those provision. Okay, great. Yes, so the Constitution itself realizes that we need a vibrant uh, press in order to advance our democracy. Yes, so the Constitution makes it clear in Article 162 that there shall be independence of the media and the press. You see, and then it also adds that there shall be no censorship, and that's where we should be very grateful. But even before we continue with the other principles that the Constitution helps to make our media vibrant and independent, we should be interested in the fact that these are guarantees, meaning that it's not the Constitution that is giving this right. They already belong to us, okay, but it's guaranteed, so meaning that the state will take steps to make sure that these rights are enjoyed. Mm -hmm. You say, yes. So to that extent, the fact that the Constitution fronts upon censorship, the Constitution itself says that look, there should be independence of the media, okay, and then there should be so editors and uh, uh, this press men should not be harassed for their opinions and all that. These are very, very, very strong principles and laws that would engender the strength of the media. Because if you check all over the world, they will tell you that, look, without a strong media, you don't have a strong democracy. No, no. You don't have a strong democracy without a strong media. You say, yes. So that apart to what I'm also equally uh, impressed about is the fact that the Constitution too knows that uh, media as they carry uh, their work, journalists as they carry their work, carry out their work, will make mistakes. So there's provision that mm. if the media or journalists make mistakes in publications, then in that case, there should be opportunity for publication of a rejoinder, which right. is very critical. Because look, if you check all over the world, yes, as we enjoy press freedom, it also naturally comes with abuse of other people's rights. So especially if I look at 1625, um, yeah, six, 1626, and let me quote it. It says, any medium for the dissemination of information to the public which publishes a statement about or against any person sh shall be obliged to publish a rejoinder, if any, from the person in respect of whom the publication was made. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very, very critical. So you see that we would so often. It gives use you the right and then there's the obligation to yes. ensure that, yeah, you yes. don't go beyond. The right that is given. It's not an absolute right. Exactly. So that is to make sure that as and when the media get it wrong, there can be a rejoinder mm -hmm. from the person whose rights have been abused. Okay. So taking these principles together, and especially also a lot of Supreme Court decisions, it's good that uh, Mr. Daku started with the U.S. Supreme Court. Right. I think that decision was approved in either MPP and GBC or the uh, MPP uh, and, uh, the, sorry, NMC versus Attorney General, one of mm -hmm. them. That, that, that statement was approved. Yeah, the Supreme Court has played such a pivotal role in sustaining these provisions. You know the famous uh, case of uh, MPP and GBC where MPP felt that GBC wasn't giving them enough time exactly. for them to disseminate their own uh, political, their, their manifesto and their messages. They went to the Supreme Court and lo and behold, the Supreme Court said no, GBC as a state uh, media organization has a duty to give them equal opportunity. And since then, I think when it gets to campaign time, yes, it's not the best. You don't <laughs> see it as exactly equal. I mean, both governments have seen it. Often the incumbent gets yeah. a slight advantage, putting it mildly, but mm -hmm. we've made progress. Sure. And then also Professor Kofi Kumado's case, very important, the uh, NMC versus uh, Attorney General. You know, those days, President Rollins, uh, the, the background was that he, the way he taught it was that President Rollins wanted to have a hand in the appointment of the uh, chairman support. of the governing councils of the state media organizations and all those. Professor Kumado said no in the constitution. That duty or that right is to the NMC, but they shall consult the president. But it looks like officialdom didn't believe so. So it also Can made its way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court 
came down in favor of the NMC. So looking at it, uh, we should also celebrate the Supreme Court for giving teeth to these uh, provisions, you see. So putting all this together, as Professor Gadiopo has stated, we've come a long way. Mm. We've come a long way where we underestimate ourselves. But I think I think we do underestimate ourselves because um, we keep talking about you know the the the, the, the maybe the ills, the wrongs, but that there are there are points that we need to celebrate as well. I think behind the scenes, I made I made a, a reference to this consistent statement that steadily we are making. And I was asking when will we actually you know make that take those heavy steps and then you pointed me correctly to the fact that it's those little steps or those little facets that we need to um, celebrate in order to you know ultimately uh, appreciate that how far we have come but looking at how far we have come then I quickly turn to I mean in the news this week we talked we, we heard about the is it reporters without um, borders mm -hmm. and they are ranking and Ghana apparently is dropping from 23 to 27 now. What do you make of that? Yeah, and I, I think that we have to remember that it, it's a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. We're making progress, and it's important that we keep our eye on the ball, but also the fact that we can retrogress when certain things are not in place or when certain events happen. I, we could all have predicted that we're going to fall in the ranking because of incidents that have happened mm. uh, the year before mm. because they use certain indices. And so, as uh, was rightly stated earlier, it's not the laws anymore. We have the laws in place. And in fact, we're going to get a boost now that we have passed the right to information bill. However, it is the atmosphere and, and that has been created mm. that makes it okay for journalists to be attacked right. with impunity. So where you have incidents, for example, the murder of Swale, Anas's uh, investigative reporter, when you have attacks on journalists, multimedia, Times, etc., by security forces, where you have, as Media Foundation for West Africa has documented individuals attacking the media, where you have political operatives, so foot soldiers, mm. attacking the media, and not much is being done about it, then you see yourself slipping in the rankings. We were number one in Africa, we we're number three, we were number 23, 23. in the world, we surpassed the US and the UK, and that's <laughs> something to celebrate. Exactly. We have been doing that, we have been in that position consistently for quite a few years, yeah. where we, we surpassed developed democracies mm -hmm. like that in terms of media freedoms. But we need that on the state level, on the level of the media organizations, on the level of media associations, that they take steps mm -hmm. to ensure that the media is protected and that people don't get away with impunity. The GJA, I'm happy to say, has started uh, supporting journalists to sue people mm. who attack. And, and the courts have, have ruled favorably in quite a number of cases. Right. That's good. I am very happy to hear the Deputy Minister for Information also talking about steps that the state intends to take mm. to ensure the security of journalists. Some media houses are better at protecting their journalists than others, mm. but I think that that's something that we need to work towards so that that, um, that that is done. Having said that, we do see public confidence in the media eroding because last year's Afrobarometer shows mm. that 57% or so of Ghanaians, you know, um, think that it's okay for laws to be to be enacted that to will restrict, to restrict right. the media. So the media has to be introspective. They need to ask themselves, mm. why is it that we're losing confidence? And that happens sometimes when we're not so accurate, when uh, we're not so professional, when um, we put ethics on the side and we behave in unethical ways. So yes, the media is doing a, a, a relatively good job in holding not just governments accountable, but other important power elites in society, right. businesses, etc. So they're doing some of that, but they ought 
to do better and they ought to be more professional and ethical mm. so that we can carry the, the, the public along. Very well. It's not, it's not easy staying on the t at the top. Yes. You need to work at it because yes. the minute you, 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 you relent on your efforts, you begin to you know, retrogress, which isn't what we want to see. So that is a word to the wise out there being thrown out by Professor Odigaji for this morning. But we need to take a break. When we come back, we will look at certain issues that have been raised here, the ethics um, of the practice, how it's being upheld, and many other issues. Stick and stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is The Key Points. We are live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and around the world at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we're looking at World Threats Freedom Day, uh, which was commemorated yesterday, 3rd of May 2019, across the globe. Now, in respect of the global celebration, we'll take a quick listen to um, a statement made by uh, the UN Secretary General in the person of Antonio Guterres and we'll come back to the panel. He was speaking on the theme of this year's um, World Press Freedom Day, which was on, it says, the role of media in elections and democracy. So let's take a listen to the UN Secretary General, and then we come back to the panel for their perspectives. A free press is essential for peace, justice, sustainable development, and human rights. No democracy is complete without access to transparent and reliable information. It is the cornerstone for building fair and impartial institutions, holding leaders accountable, and speaking truth to power. And this is especially true during election seasons, the focus of this year's World Press Freedom Day. Facts, not falsehoods, should guide people as they choose their representatives. Yet, while technology has transformed the ways in which we receive and share information, sometimes it is used to mislead public opinion or to fuel violence and hatred. Civic space has been shrinking worldwide at an alarming rate. And with anti-media rhetoric on the rise, so too are violence and harassment against journalists, including women. I am deeply troubled by the growing number of attacks and the culture of impunity. According to UNESCO, almost 100 journalists were killed in 2018. Hundreds are imprisoned. And when media workers are targeted, societies as a whole pay a price. On World Press Freedom Day, I call on all to defend the rights of journalists whose efforts help us to build a better world for all. Thank you. So that was the UN Secretary General, the Antonio Guterres, calling on all to defend um, press freedom wherever we find ourselves. Um, we'll be looking at uh, this other aspects of the conversation and we've st we started talking about it behind the scenes which has to do with the, uh, let me use the word perceived, the perceived drop in, <laughs> in, in, in you know, confidence in the media. Why it is that the media who we know to be the spokesperson of the people and as Professor Odigadipo said in her, in her submissions earlier, we can't all be speaking at once. We can't, I mean, it's, it's not possible. We can't be asking the questions of our duty bearers and all. It, a group of people would, 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 would be doing that, and we find the media doing that. So if that is the case, why is it that the citizenry or some members of the citizenry feel as though the media is being intrusive when it comes to certain areas where the media is actually acting on behalf of the populace? Well, I think that... Uh, journalism, as I said, we have to make sure that the deception of government and all state actors are exposed so that the citizens will know who is doing the right thing and who is doing the wrong thing. Naturally, as human beings, nobody wants his or her wrongdoing to be exposed to the public. And therefore, when journalists go about doing their work and they ended up exposing the ills of society and people who are seen as untouchable in society are exposed, it becomes a challenge for some people in society who think they owe some form of allegiance to these big people in society, thinking that why should the media turn attention to this person in this country? 
And for me, I think that is where we have to focus the attention. As I said earlier, Hugo Black said that we are supposed to serve the governed and not the governors. And that is exactly what the media is doing. But it seems the governed now are having some session of the governed <laughs> who think they are godfathers or godmothers or spiritual leaders or whatever in society should not be touched, have now become like opponents of the media. And so the very moment the media puts out some information and it's about certain people, they are supporters or people who feel that they have a certain allegiance to those people, think that the media is rather being too intrusive and therefore will decide to act in certain ways. And that is how come we've seen even individuals attacking the, the, the media. In fact, my personal conversation with certain people in the police service and the security service is, is that they, they think that the media is their enemy. Why? Because somebody serves 10 years in the service, 15 years in the service, and has gone to commit one uh, 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 problem. And then the media exposes and that person either gets sacked in the service or get dismissed or get reduced in rank. And they think that why can somebody serve for 10 years, 15 years, and by just one action, and because the media brought it to light, now the sin, uh, top hierarchy has taken action against that person. So a lot of people in this area are really peeved, especially those who have suffered because the, of media publication or their friends and colleagues in the service have suffered. So anytime they are in, in location, they see the media people trying to do their work, they feel like this is a time for us to also give them some some beating. And so, that, so, so, that, that has been a mentality in the secret. This is so you think it's, it's, it's arising out of, you know, the need to, as it were, um, look out for the apparel interest more than it is a case of miss conception yes, of, of course of, of course because people think that where you are going and what you are doing is affecting my interest mm. okay if my spiritual leader is being exposed for a certain wrongdoing that is the person i revered as my spirit and i don't think that that person should be exposed to that level okay if the politician is my godfather or something you are exposing that person i don't think that should be the case if it's my father that you have exposed, my father has been a policeman for 10 years, 15 years, and maybe you went and chanced upon him, maybe taking one Ghana by the roadside, and you publish it, and then the top director says, oh, this is bribe taking. So for all your 15 years in the service, you have been completely dismissed. No package for you to go home. So people are not looking at the benefit to the general society. They are looking at their personal interests and what they, they are losing in terms of what your actions are, are, are doing. And therefore for them, it is about mm, what I stand to lose or what I think you cannot do. Mm. And therefore, the, the, the view that we are rather exposing the deception of state actors and that we are doing that in the interest of the governed, there are a section of the governed who do not think that what we are doing is, there, is in their interest because it is rather affecting their personal interest. And therefore, they have to take action and protect those people or do something. And that is what has resulted in this attacks on media people and, and, in several ways. What, do you, what, what would you say to people who say that may be an overgeneralization of the issue, as in maybe it's just a few people who, by reason of their experiences, are reacting this way, but generally that may not be? But if you have the Afrobarometer, which mm. is a scientific study, telling you that as high as 57% of your people are thinking that if the opportunity should avail itself, <laughs> government should be given the opportunity to do some, make some draconian laws to control the media, to the extent that even when government has information that you are going to publish something and government disagree with you, government should have the power to Thank stop you, the yeah. media house from publishing. Just as it happened in America in mm. the, the uh, Viet Vietnam case, they got information that the public was being deceived. Mm. And New York Times ran the first story. They just got a portion of the document. And the American government said, no, you can't do that because this is state secret. And you have to go to the Supreme Court. And that is the mentality we are talking about mm. today. So, is it when these things are being exposed and you think that the media is when 57% of your citizens in a scientific study mm. are saying that the government should be that, giving that, power that, to that, control you? Then that's, I think that, we are that, that's, that's, that's quite worrying. Let, let me it's come what, to you. How do they determine the harmful? Uh -huh. Exactly. The point is, if, if somebody has done a wrong thing, or if, let's say a, a, a religious leader mm -hmm. is involved in something and is exposed and its church members are not happy. And for that reason, they think that the media should be controlled. What is harmful about you? So you see, it is now between whether the truth should be exposed or not. I know the media have its own 
weaknesses and challenges. But leaving the weakness and challenges aside, this mentality of peace certain people are beyond criticism or are beyond expose mm. is what we need to focus on. The citizens might Very be able well. to understand Let that. Me quickly it's in their own interest. Mr. Pebu here, for your perspective on this, this whole thing about this perception that, you know, if, if, if there's an opportunity for, for government to control the media, mm -hmm. people would actually endorse him. I, I find that very worrying, given exactly. where we are coming from exactly. and uh, what we have in our constitution, which guarantees, you know, press freedom and all, for people to have that kind of mentality. And it's, it's important that Elvis is also mentioning or highlighting emphatically the point that this is a scientific research. So it's something that we cannot discount. Yes. Uh I've not, but what I'm thinking is that, you see, uh, you know, being a research, from what, when I Googled it up, I saw that what they said was that they should control things that are harmful to, to society. As what is harmful can be subjective, because uh, what one man sees as good, another man will see as bad, right? So for me, that's why I say it's a, uh, 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 it's, it's a worrying perception, mm -hmm. right? I think that looking at the uh, society, though, uh, of uh, this uh, of the program where we had the battle, of camera. Where, uh, yes, mm -hmm. of camera, where uh, Professor uh, Gadifo was telling me to be careful about no, uh, anecdotal evidence. Look, living in Ghana, I get the impression that, look, we are largely behind the media because of the great work that's been done. But it's unfortunate a scientific study is showing otherwise, okay? Yes, because you know that without you, without media accountability, where would we be? Without media accountability, holding the government accountable, where would we be? See all the big, big stories, the great ways that the media have done, they've uncovered, wrought, you know, the corruption and everything. Yeah, so it's surprising that a scientific study shows otherwise. But as I said, for me, to the extent that what is harmful could be subjective, yes, because we have different moral compasses, you know. Uh -huh. So I, I, I'm not troubled. But that's by why it's them. not it's not left to the judgment. Or, I mean, like individual people's judgments. That's mm -hmm. why you have subjective laws. I mean, sorry, objective basis for yeah. determining what is you know good or what is bad. Exactly. What is wrong. But it doesn't appear to me that the research, because what they said was that the the, the media should be controlled when they are doing stuff that harms society. It doesn't. Prof can correct me or Mr. Dako. It doesn't appear to me that the research was skewed on what is good and what is bad. That wasn't the focus of it. Mm. So that, that's what I'm saying that, no, so the research doesn't bother me as such. I think that Ghanaians as a whole, we are generally behind the media because of the great works that the media have done. They've been a bastion of our democracy. They've helped to uncover. They've educated citizens, okay? And so this has helped us because, you know, until we had this uh, pluralistic media, it was one way. Yes. And the government could swindle citizens, so to speak, by you know channeling information one way, skewing mm -hmm. it to uh, favor what they think. But with a pluralistic media, you always get the other side, and right. that's what is keeping us going. Very well, uh, Professor Gajipo. Yes. Still on this yes issue. Yes, and, and I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Let me just read that portion right. of the Afrobarometer sure. findings to you. It says only about one in three Ghanaians, 36 percent, support full media freedom a sharp drop from 55% in 2014. Oh, so you have to be asking, why is it that we supported it more irrespective yes. of what the, the meaning was? A majority, 57%, say instead that the government should have the right to prevent the publication of information it deems harmful to society, which is the point that Martin is making, and it seems fair that if you are asked if it's harmful, should government control it? Of course, people are going to say government should. Among 21 African countries surveyed in 2016-2018, Ghana ranks well below average, 47% in its support for media freedoms. That's why we have to be worried. Mm. When you do, do it comparatively, and when you put it in this perspective, what then is the survey telling us? The survey is generally telling us that we don't want a free and unfettered media. Where, well, a few years ago, we did think that it was important to have a wider berth for media freedoms. Right. And that's why I'm saying, and, and I take the point that Elvis made about people's parochial interests in, 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 in attacking the media when they think that their interests are endangered. endangered. <laughs> However, I do also think 
that there are reasonable people who don't really feel that way, yes. but who do who think that the media is not professional enough mm. and they do harm. In other words, one part of media freedom, the other side is responsibility. Sure. So they are free, but they are not exercising their responsibility um, properly. And, and in that sense, they are doing more harm than good. Exactly. And I think that it's important for the media, those who work in the media, to be more introspective and say, how can we improve? Now, it's complex because we have a huge media terrain. There are almost 400 radio stations, as you know, more than 30 free on air television stations, all of these publications as well. Out of that, some would be irresponsible all the, of the time. S some of the media are overtly partisan. True. They are owned by people who are aligned to political mm. parties and they make no apologies for it. So they do not use the media in the public interest. Sure. But there is also mercifully for us a group of media organizations that the public identifies as mainstream, as significant, as responsible, and we go to them for news and information and we expect them to do their work professionally. Mm. You know, so because of this mixed bag, I'm afraid you are going to have findings like that. And I think we really need to worry about it a little bit more. Yes, and still on that let finding. Me, let me say okay. You see, the, what the aspect of the barometer survey that is worrying, mm. which is saying that it says that government, when government deem the information harmful, mm. not when the people need it harmful. Yes, but and the government is an interest par interested party in that information. But, but so but, if the government says information A, in my view, is harmful, mm. ha are you telling me that we should all take it that it's harmful? Mm. So, so if the people are saying that government should be able to stop the publication of information it deems harmful mm -hmm. to the public, is it, is it, then is it the information no, no, government me. deems. Can I come in yeah. sure, now sure. to just tell uh, yes. because I don't think we need to litigate this. Sure. No, no, the no. public. No, no. I'm, just I'm, a minute. Let, I'll let me to land. You. Let, 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 let I'm just saying that the import of the findings is what we should worry about, sure. not um, not the fact that people think government or not. We all know as professionals that government is an interested party. Mm -hmm. As the, the reason why we even have the National Media Commission is to insulate the, the, the media from governmental oh. control. We all know that. But we are saying that there is a public out there that is unhappy with the way the media discharges their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And I think it needs leadership within the media space to speak to about it. That. Look, the, the GJA doesn't even have uh, uh, an ethics, a functioning ethics uh, committee okay. anymore. At the beginning of democratization, they have. How do they sanction members mm. who do the wrong thing? Right. Because self-regulation is key. important sure. in order to to stave off external regulation. Very well. Quickly, then we'll take a break and I'll come back to you. To yeah, no, I, 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 I'm not for one saying that the media doesn't have excesses, mm -hmm. but I'm saying that the perception that government deems something harmful and therefore government can stop it is something we should let the public know that it's not in the interest of the governed. Mm. It is the interest of the governors. So if you are giving the governor the power to say this is not in the interest of the public, then you the government will never be saved. And no. that's my point. Yeah, but, but for but, but, the excesses of the media, I agree right. But there are various issues need to be tackled mm. when it comes to excesses of the media. Mm. People talk about public interest journalism. The question is, who should fund it? And mm. where should the funding come from? Mm. People talk about the media excesses. I ask people, who is the journalist? What is the capacity of the practitioner? Mm. A lot of people write things sometimes when you you have discussion, you realize the person really is ignorant about what he's even writing. Mm -hmm. But because of capacity issues in the industry, mm -hmm. and the industry doesn't have an entry point, and just anybody so, at all can just find we space and say, I am a journalist, there are critical issues I agree we very need well. to address. Sure. But and issues we must about professionalism and as, ethics as media coming up them. strongly. We will be turning our attention to that aspect when we return from the break. Stick and stay with us. This is the key points. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back. This is the key points on TV3, also on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we have just about 10 minutes to wrap up on the show here. Uh, we are looking at 
World Press Freedom Day, the essence of press freedom. What are we doing to continue to enjoy press freedom in Ghana? And we are touching now on issues about professionalism of the media practitioners as well as ethics that are to be upheld, whether or not this is being done. Um, we'll be looking also at the theme of this year's World Press Freedom Day, which is um, the role of um, is it the role of media in elections. We'll be touching on that as well. We don't have much time, but we'll try to do all of that within the next 10 minutes. Uh, Mr. Pebu, I'll come to you here regarding the issues that are coming up in terms of professionalism and ethics and how that is affecting, you know, the confidence levels. Okay. Yeah, so uh, you remember I mentioned it earlier that, well, as long as you have an activity, okay, you have a profession, you are bound to have excesses in any human endeavor. Yes, I haven't seen even in medicine, you know, doctors make mistakes in surgery and patients die, or even the diagnosis and even the yeah. medication and all that. Yes, yeah, so looking at it in that context, we are bound to have uh, excesses, okay? So it's good that there are also provisions in the law that are meant to curb the excesses. So apart from the constitutional provision, Article 162, that I mentioned about publishing mm. reminders, there's also uh, civil law, tort law. So if a media house publishes information that is false, you have the right to sue in a defamation. You say it. Yes, and also you have, um, and when you sue in defamation, you know, it comes with paying of monetary damages. I think you remember the case of uh, Jojo Bruce Kwanza. You know, there was a judgment against him. Mm. They had to sell his house, and it led to so many things, you know, because that was going to take everything that he had told for in this world. There are other judgments. You remember... Uh, Mr. Hackman, who said, yeah, who yeah. also won some judgments and so on. And so on. Uh -huh, exactly. I said, okay, yeah. So you see that the examples could go on and on. So you see that we have laws that are meant to deal with the excesses. Check, and yeah. so uh, it means that for a society such as ours, as a prof has said, we've all repeated it in different ways. We are making good progress. Yeah, Ghana is far stronger than uh, we actually seem to see. Very well. Prof, uh, the role of media in elections, that's the theme for this year's World Press Freedom Day. Your perspective on that. It's a very yeah. a very interesting theme. Yeah, and it's a very important role. And I, I can I imagine why it's on the agenda of uh, World Press Freedom Day mm -hmm. because of what allegedly happened in the U.S., because of the way in which now with social media, you know, it's easy to influence elections and pollute the media space. I think that people rely on the media, mm. both traditional and social media, in an election yeah. to tell them about who the candidates are and what the issues are. And, and, and help them decide, you know. So it's been the normative role of the media in elections uh, from time immemorial. Right. So how the media cover elections has a bearing on, on, yeah. on the outcomes of the elections, or so we think. Now, because of social media and the fact that all candidates use social media now, I mean, I don't think you can win <laughs> an election without yeah. social media. Yeah. Um, and citizens, of course, go on social media. It's easy for fake news to propagate. At first, we used to think social media may break the news, but traditional media will then bring credibility to the mm. news. In other words, if we hear it on traditional media, we know it's it true. It is the news, yeah. But now we know that some people don't even go on traditional media at all. So social media is the space or the internet is the space where uh, election uh, battles are being fought. How do we make sure mm. that that space has integrity? I'm not sure that the world knows yet. Right. And I think it's something that, that we, we have to, to be concerned about. Sure. about. Right. Having said that though, the way to do it is not what African countries have, some African countries Total have ban. done. That is, that during the election period, there should be no social media. Right. Because that sort of action inures only to the benefit of the incumbent right. who has the power to shut down right. social media right. and prevent alternative sources of news right. back there. Sure. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, but I'll give you one minute or 30 seconds, Elvis, to run. Well, I must say that it's very important because yes. elections are like 
power places yeah. and there's so much tension. Mm. And as Prof. has said, I think the, the problem is social media. If, if you look at the last American elections and if you consider the role social media has played in our part of the world, we are facing something that is can be very good but can also be very dangerous. And therefore, we must try and find strategies, especially as to how to authenticate information on social media mm. before running with it. If not, it could really cause us trouble. Very well, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> also, yes. We haven't celebrated the people who leak information to the media houses. Oh. They are the real heroes. Really? They, yes. They, the credible, credible information. Yes. Leaking credible yes. information, not the, the, the ones here. Yeah, they are the real heroes. <laughs> you call them the leakers. Yes. Very well. Unfortunately, we, this is where we draw the curtains on the show. There's so much to talk about, but very, very limited time. So we hope to have the opportunity to look at this issue into some more detail some other time. But I'd like to say a very, very big thank you to my panelists. From my extreme left, we have Professor Audrey Gajapo. She is the Dean of School of Information and Communication Studies at the University of Ghana. We also had Mr. Elvis Darko. He's the editor of the Finder newspaper. And Mr. Martin Bibu, who is a legal practitioner. I say a big thank you to you as well for making a date with us. We thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning with us. We'll be back here same time next week. Until then, have a good weekend and a pleasant week ahead of you. Bye-bye.